Oh, Callahan, there are two O'Callaghans in this class, and you are by far the worst of them. Those words still ring in my ears, although they were first spoken a long, long time ago, 1979, by my Latin teacher, who had finally lost patience with me. I think maybe I was the owner van der Waal of Ireland at the time. <laughs> or perhaps owner's teacher had moved to Ireland, who knows? But uh, I think I met him or his, his uh, brother or some member of his family in, in uh, Cork, Ireland, 1979. And when I looked at my rival, the other O'Callaghan, imagine I was the worst of the O'Callaghans. Luckily, there were only two of us in the class. It could have been a lot worse. But when I looked at him, I knew I couldn't beat him up uh, to sort of settle the score. So I had to, in some way, settle the score in the field of academia. And I knew I could close the gap. I knew that I could do that. I knew it was humanly possible for me to close the gap between myself and the other O'Callaghan and get back the family honor. Because it's, it's a kind of a shame to the clan. So I worked really hard. He was far more motivated than I was. He was harder working than I was. But I worked really, really hard. And eventually, I did close the gap. And the thing is, it was humanly possible to do that. It was personally possible, but it was also humanly possible. I've been teaching for a long time, I think about maybe 27 years or, or thereabouts. And in the time I've been teaching, I've met students from every kind of ability range. And I've uh, taught students from the age of six up to the age of 60. And I have never yet come across a student who could not enhance their learning ability through excellent teaching, through hard work, through increased uh, motivation, or some kind of targeted program which would help them. Um, cognitive enhancement has always been a feature of education. We have always found ways to accelerate learning and to help students. And we all love the stories, don't we, of the underdog, of the student who really struggled at school, but who later on went on to MIT or Harvard or the top law school in the country. We love the story of the worker in the company, maybe the worker's at the bottom of the heap, and he and she, they, they, or they crawl the way up the corporate ladder to eventually get to the boardroom. We love those stories. We love the stories of the way people dig down really deep into the human spirit and they find something in there which causes them to succeed. However, what happens when being human is simply not good enough? What happens when actually being merely human is a disadvantage? And I want to talk today about methods of enhancing the human being. Because we live in a world in which a particular philosophy is, is uh, gaining root, gaining ground. And it's a very interesting philosophy. It's called transhumanism. And it's all about transcending our humanity, finding ways to make ourselves better, stronger, faster, more clever. And we live in an age where it is possible to uh, redesign ourselves. We can actually design and redesign ourselves. And this is not science fiction. It sounds a little bit like science fiction. But in fact, it's science fact. And uh, we can use genetics to design or redesign ourselves at the most basic level. We can use pharmaceuticals to alter the chemistry of our brains. We can use pharmaceuticals to make our bodies go faster, uh, to make them stronger. We can use cybernetics, for example. If I have uh, some kind of limb trauma, I can replace my limbs through cybernetics. We can even use robotics to help our uh, um, physical selves. 
uh, a, a, an exoskeleton has been designed which fits over the human body and it increases human strength. So you can lift weights you could never lift uh, before, you can climb faster, walk faster. So we have the ability to enhance ourselves and to expand ourselves. And this is fantastic. I love all of these things. I love all of these advances. I love the thought of expanding our horizons. However, at the same time, we really have to think about this whole issue of human enhancement because unless access to enhancement is universalized, unless everybody has access to it, then we're going to end up with massive inequalities in society and inequalities like we have never seen before because it's going to be impossible for ordinary people to close the gap. So I could close the gap with the other O'Callaghan. It was humanly possible to do it. However, what about a situation where the competitor, the rival, is a computer assisted? For example, how could someone like uh, Gary Kasparov, the chess grandmaster, how could he win against the supercomputer which beat him? Um, how can we fight against those odds? And the age of merging together humans and computers is actually here. Again, it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. It's actually real. And I just want to talk a little bit to you about these uh, uh, interfaces which connect the, our, our minds together with computers. And what the interfaces do, this is uh, one example of an interface. It's a fairly simple and sleek looking one. They can look something like this, okay? And these mediate signals from the uh, mind to a computer. So they turn our thoughts into signals, and then those signals can control external devices. And uh, these, is, it, these are perfectly possible. They're being used extensively. And I just want to give you some examples of how they are being used at the moment. And just to give you an idea of the way in which they enhance the ability of those who can use them. So for example, imagine you are someone who has a, a job where you have to search through large amounts of images or text. And uh, you go into your office one morning and you're searching through the images, you're searching through the text, You've been given the task of finding certain objects or certain words or phrases. Who knows? But you're searching through them, and suddenly the worker next to you, the person next to you, is racing through the same kinds of images, the same kinds of te text, 300 to 600 times faster than you. Okay, it sounds, again, it sounds Im impossible. It sounds fantastic, but using uh, a, an interface is perfectly achievable. There is a program, Neurotechnology for Intelligence Analysts, which uh, enables the person who wears the interface, it enables them to speed up their thinking and their searching abilities uh, so that they really can work at this almost superhuman speed. Another interesting program is Adaptive Peak Performance. And Adaptive Peak Performance, or APPT, what this does is it, it, uh, it mediates signals from the brain. It reads what's going on in your head. And when you're training for something, so for instance, marksmanship, they've used it in the army to train people to shoot. It sees exactly what's going on. It, it, when you miss a shot, it sees what's going on in your head when that happens. And it can feed information back to you. So it feeds information about what's going on in your head, what's going on physiologically. And those who have used it have increased their accuracy by 230%. That's massive, 230%. So a novice 
uh, marksman against uh, a novice marksman who's using this program is always going to lag uh, behind. Another very uh, fascinating program is this uh, uh, targeted neuroplasticity training. And what this does is, again, it uses an interface to stimulate the peripheral nervous system. And by doing this, it releases neurochemicals into the brain. These neurochemicals then massively increase learning ability. So for example, if you're trying to acquire a language, this will help you to do it much faster than anybody else. If you're trying to learn a new skill of any kind, this kind of interface will really help you. So these make a very big difference, and it's very difficult to close the gap. And we really have to think about this, these advances coming onto the, the commercial market, because th that is actually happening. Uh, you can buy a device, it costs less than 100, uh, 150 dollars, and it can actually read your thoughts. And it can allow you to uh, move avatars on a, ga uh, on a screen, a, a game on the screen, using the power of thought alone. And I just want to show you a picture here. These are competitors in something called the Cybathlon. The Cybathlon was held in Zurich in 2016, uh, just a, a few weeks ago. And these competitors are all competing in a race. They're Paralymp Paralympians, and they have to use their thoughts to control avatars on the screen. So it's a race going on on the screen between the avatars. And here you can see the game itself uh, in play. And if you think about it, as this kind of technology is becoming more and more sophisticated, we are going to be able to, ex uh, to control more external devices with our minds. Um, this uh, this uh, program, the BrainGate program, which is being run out of uh, Providence VA Hospital and Massachusetts General, allowed this lady who had been paralyzed for 15 years through an implant. Now, this is an external device, okay? The, the devices I've talked about so far are kind of caps that can be put onto the head, they're external. Uh, this lady has had implants put into her, her, into her head, and those implants allow her to think certain thoughts and send signals to a robot. And she is, has been able to send signals from her mind to a robotic arm to feed her uh, a cup of coffee. And this is the first occasion in which she's been able to feed herself in 15 years. So we're entering into an era where implanted devices in our heads can allow us using our thoughts to make things happen. And this is going to revolutionize learning, but it's also going to possibly create, unless we really, really think it through, it's going to possibly create a world in which we have the haves and the have-nots uh, to a degree where it's really, really difficult to bridge the gap. And what tends to happen with these kind of advances is that discussion about the ethics of them goes on in the labs, okay? So when they're being developed, a lot of discussion goes on about the ethics. But often that discussion doesn't really trickle down into the street. It doesn't trickle down to you, to me. And quite often, when these uh, products then come on the market, we suddenly find ourselves dealing with the social implications. So we need, uh, over, the, over the next short few years, when these advances are being developed further, when they're being made far more sophisticated, we need to take the time to think. We need to take the time to examine what's going to happen next. What kind of a world 
are we moving into the human enhancement world really, I think, presents us with challenges which we have never had before because they could very, very easily uh, uh, split, partition our societies in a way in which we just cannot solve. Thank you very much.